Welcome to our fourth Friday from the Archives presentation. I'm Penny Cliff, Education Specialist here at the Georgia Archives. Today's presentation is Disaster Preparedness and Response by Georgia Archives Conservator Sigourney Smuts. Originally from Cape Town, South Africa, and with a decade of experience in conservation, Sigourney has been the conservator for the Georgia Archives since 2019. She earned her MA in Conservation of Fine Art, specializing in paper conservation from Northumbria University in the United Kingdom, and has worked in both the US and South Africa, specializing in paper, book, and photo conservation, as well as teaching and advising on emergency preparedness and response for cultural heritage. Now, if you have friends or family who are unable to view this webinar, they still can enjoy this presentation as it will be uploaded to the Georgia Archives YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of our presentations. And now, welcome Sigourney. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us this, well, this afternoon for this prepared disaster preparedness and response webinar. Uh, disasters are an unfortunate fact of life and the best way to ensure that you can minimize potential damage to your home's property as well as to keep your loved ones safe is a good preparedness strategy as well as minimizing damage that may occur with a swift response. Disasters can come in various shapes and sizes, and they're very, the most common types of disasters are fires, winter weather, severe weather, floods, tornadoes and hurricanes, earthquakes, biological, such as the COVID-19 pandemic we are currently going through, and terrorism. There's also smaller disasters just caused by human error. You may not think of it, but spilling a cup of coffee onto your laptop may be a very, very large disaster if that laptop's important for running your small business or if it has valuable family documents or photographs that would be lost. Disasters can come in a range of scope as well. They can be isolated, meaning only your home or maybe your business, and this could be something such as a burst pipe, a leak or any small things like that. It could be local, such as your neighborhood or city, and this could include things like power outages. These power outages could have additional knock-on effects with uh, freezers not being kept cold or other things like that. And then there could be regional, such as in the southeast, where you may have a hurricane come through or tornadoes. Uh, and then it could be national or international, such as again the pandemic. The key to minimizing the effects of any type of disaster is a quick response but it can be often difficult to react confidently without prior training. The best way to ensure that disasters are dealt with quickly and appropriately to save you and your family is to plan ahead. When we are put under stress, we don't always think clearly and we can go into reactionary mode. This means that we may not have the best response and do the best thing possible. So the way to make sure that you do not have the negative effects of stress in a disaster is to plan appropriately. The first step in preparing for any type of disaster or emergency is to assess the potential risks. This means walking around your home or place of work and having a look at what the conditions are and what may potentially happen. You can then take steps to mitigate against those risks or minimize them. You can also then make sure you have appropriate materials and equipment on hand to deal with a range of emergencies and disasters that are appropriate that you have been that you have just identified with your assessment. You want to make sure that you review your insurance to ensure that you have proper coverage and an accurate inventory of your valuable possessions. If you identify that flooding may be a potential risk for your area, you want to make sure that you have flood, uh, flood coverage, for example. You also want to make sure you have an emergency and disaster plan that can be followed were an emergency to occur. And again, this will be specific to the type of disasters you have identified as being a potential risk. In this, you want to consider things as well as assigning roles and performing drills on this disaster response. So, for example, you may decide that one person's role is to grab the go kits and the other person gets the children. In this, you also want to make sure you're 
thinking about where you're going to go should you need to evacuate or shelter in place due to uh, due to severe weather. You want to know what you're going to do in this type of emergency. Muscle memory is very important when you have a disaster. So by practicing, you can ensure that you don't have to think too hard and you can just follow that muscle memory. You also want to have multiple copies of your disaster plan, both digitally and physically available. Uh, you should have them on site and off site because you don't know whether or not you'll have power or, elect, um, or uh, internet to have access to a digital copy. And maybe you won't have access to your building, so you will need an off site copy to be able to follow. As we said, the first step for preparing for any type of emergency is to conduct a risk assessment. This is important as it lets you know where any weak points are in your home or business and what potential disasters may occur. Some disasters may be completely avoided through this assessment by addressing the risk ahead of time through regular maintenance. For example, you can fix leaking pipes or loose electrical wires, or if there's any holes in the building that may allow flooding to enter or pests. Some disasters may only be minimized. For example, you may not be able to prevent a, bur a burst pipe ever occurring. However, you can take steps to make sure that were this to occur, it won't have a very large impact. High humidity is another problem in the southeast due to our climate, and you also need to consider physical damage to an item, such as just dropping it. Some disasters may only be mitigated against, and this will include severe weather, you cannot control your climate. However, if you know that you get certain types of weather in your region, you can take steps to make sure that any knock on effects that weather has won't negatively affect your business or your home. And then some disasters cannot be controlled at all and they can only be reacted to. This is predominantly wide area natural disasters such as hurricanes, floods, earthquakes and wildfires. If you were to live on the coast of Georgia, hurricanes may be a very real threat that you need to be aware of and be able to prepare for if it were to happen. As we said, some things can be uh, minimized or mitigated against with regular maintenance, and it's a good idea to potentially have a checklist so that you know what routine maintenance needs to be done in your home or around your business. While this is not an exhaustive list, it's a good place to start and you may be able to find other checklists online that you can tailor towards your specific needs. Some things you may want to consider is, do you have any large trees near your home? Are any of the branches overhanging your roof and need to be trimmed back? Does your roof look sound? Do any shingles need to be replaced? Is your gutter sound and need to be replaced or is it cleared out regularly? What about your drainage system or plumbing? Is that maintained and in good working order? If you have a chimney, do you clean it at least once a year? Do you always turn off your portable heaters when you go to bed? Do you clean out the lint filter in your dryer after every use? Do you vacuum and dust your smoke detector regularly to make sure that it's working correctly? And do you test your smoke detector regularly? Is there a fire extinguisher easily accessible in your, uh, your kitchen? So these are some places that you may want to think about when starting. As previously said, severe weather is something you can only really mitigate against, so it's important you know the weather patterns for your geographic location. When is your rainy season and how does the rain affect your area or home? Are you an area that's prone to flooding? Does your area get snow and ice and what preparations can you do to make sure that that is cleared and doesn't cause any hazards? It's also good to know the potential natural disasters in your geographic location, such as earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, lightning storms, and forest fires. With this information, you can ensure that your home is reasonably sealed and weatherproof for your specific type of climate. You may choose different types of materials for your building on the interior and exterior based on this information. If you live in a climate that gets very hot, you may choose very different materials than if you're in a climate that may get very cold and icy over winter. Landscaping is another important factor that's often overlooked. Landscaping can be used to drain excess water away from the building as opposed to having it pull up against the walls. It can also act as a fire break were you to be in an area that's prone to wildfires. And it can also make clearing snow and ice much easier so that you can prevent hazards when coming in and out of a home or place of business. With all this information, you can then decide on what's disaster supplies and equipment you may need to deal with any potential disasters that may occur. It's very important that you have a first aid kit to deal with any small injuries that occur. 
You also want to have fire extinguishers, smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors in your home or business. You need to have work rubber or nitrile gloves as if in case you need to handle any hazardous materials. And you may consider having an N95 mask if there's any airborne particulates that you don't want to breathe in. One thing to be aware of is that the COVID-19 surgical mask that we wear to protect ourselves from the spread of COVID is not the same as an N95 mask and it won't be appropriate, especially if you're dealing with any mold. Paper towels or pet training pads are wonderful if you want to mop up any small spills. If you're in an area that may be prone to flooding, you may consider having some sandbags that you can use to stop uh, water ingress into your building. And you can use water absorbent socks, which are the uh, funny little socks on the bottom right of the image. And these uh, can be used to cordon off flooding so that it does not extend further. A wet dry vacuum can also be used to then get rid of any standing water. If you get an area that is gets snow and ice, you may want to have snow shovels and ice melt or rock salt to be able to clear that. And you may consider a generator in case you lose power. Portable battery stations can also be valuable if you want to charge small electronics like your cell phone. And plastic sheeting is really great as an emergency response material as you can use it to cover anything that may be getting wet due to flooding or any leaks. And you can also use it to cover any windows that may be broken due to uh, debris flying. Smoke uh, fire is one of the most damaging and dangerous emergencies that may occur. So early detection is the best defense to either save human life or be able to uh, put out the fire quickly before it spreads. You want to make sure that you maintain uh, the smoke detectors regularly so they can function properly. You want to check the batteries at least annually. You want to keep them clean from dust and debris, and you can do this by vacuuming them and dusting them and you want to replace the full alarm every 10 years. According to a 2015 National Fire Protection Association report, 46% of home fires between 2009 and 2013 had missing or disconnected batteries, 24% had dead batteries, 6% was due to a lack of cleaning, and 3% was due to improper installation or placement. So this shows just how valuable these smoke detectors can be in preventing fires getting out of control. This is specific for your home, but you also want to consider placement of alarms within your place of work. You want to have one in every bedroom, one outside every separate sleeping area, one on every level of the home, including the attic and basement, and one in every living space. You don't want to place them closer than 10 feet to cooking appliances or near bathrooms, as this can give a false alarm. You also don't want to place them near windows, doors, or ducts with drafts, or near fans as this will blow any smoke away and you may not get a notification in time. Besides uh, fire detection, it's good to have fire suppression and an ABC fire extinguisher is the most appropriate for most homes or businesses. These cover class A, which is ordinary materials such as wood, paper, cloth, rubber and plastics, class B, which is flammable liquids and class C, which is electronics or electrical fires. They should be available in areas like your kitchen, laundry room and garage or any area where there's a potential of a fire occurring. Uh, these should only be used for small fires and when there's no risk to the person who is operating it and when in doubt, rather evacuate the building. How, one thing to remember is that as you're evacuating, you may decide to grab a um, fire extinguisher if it's easily accessible. As this way, if there's a small fire between you and your exit, you can use the fire extinguisher to tamp down the fire enough to allow you to escape. Once you have identified the appropriate disaster supplies that you need for the potential risks you've identified, you want to store them appropriately to ensure their long shelf life and ease of accessibility. You want to store them in a cool, dry place. Have them easily accessible if you need to get to them in a hurry. And one way to do this is make sure that they're well organized. And this can be done by having them in bins with lids or resealable bags, and these should be well labeled. You can also use backpacks or duffel bags for go kits. And you should regularly inventory uh, your disaster supplies to make sure that nothing's expired or if anything's been used and not replaced. I mentioned go kits or mobile disaster supplies, and ideally you should have one for each member of your family, including your pets. 
These should include personal protective equipment, such as gloves and masks, hand sanitizer, a basic first aid kit, medicine that's appropriate to that person or pet, non-perishable food, potable water, a multi-tool, flashlights or batteries if you don't have access to a cell phone that's got a flashlight. You may consider having solar charges for phones and other important gadgets, and an emergency radio if you don't have access to a cell phone as well. You also want to have copies of all your important documents in your Go kits, but make sure that these are secured so that they're not going to be available just to random people coming through. For more information on Go kits, you can look at www.ready.gov forward slash kit. As I mentioned, uh, it's important to have documentation in your Go kits because if you need to evacuate, you will need access to certain information that may not be readily accessible if you are not in your building. This should include bank account information, birth certificates, driver's licenses, medical history and immunization records, and make sure you keep your family up to date on their tetanus shots. You should also have pet records, social security cards, titles or deeds to property, insurance records, your family emergency plan, and your disaster plan. It's important that these are backed up digitally and uh, physically, and you also want to make sure that you do have off-site copies as well. Lots of copies keep stuff safe, so try remember that. Your insurance documentation will be incredibly important in any type of disaster, as you may have to put in an insurance claim. One useful thing to do is include descriptions and photos of your dwelling's current condition and the condition of other structures such as fences or decks. So this is the current condition as of today, so it can be valuable to show the difference of what has been damaged due to a specific disaster. You should also include personal property inventory and valuation for major appliances, furniture, jewelry, art, and other valuables. You should also review the extent of your coverage for relevant hazards such as flooding, as well as the dollar amount of the coverage. This dollar amount should be appropriate for what you are insuring. The Georgia Man Emergency Management Agency and Homeland Security has an offshoot of the National Ready Program called Ready Georgia. On their website, you can have access to a family emergency plan that you fill out for your specific family. This includes meeting locations and an individual's contact details, and it's pocket sized so you can take it with you and keep it anywhere. The family emergency plan is one component of a larger disaster plan, and we'll get into that in a few more slides. Ready Georgia also has ready resources for kids, and these are kid friendly preparedness resources, including checklists and games, so you can prepare your children without scaring them. This is important as children will be a factor in a disaster and they can be a valuable resource. Your disaster plan should include, as I said, more than just your family emergency plan. It should also include uh, emergency specific procedures. For example, if there were to be a flood, where are the utility shutoffs for the water? What to do in terms of mopping up spills? Maybe even having contact details for plumbers. So once you identify those specific risks and hazards that may occur, you then want to have uh, procedures related to those uh, types of hazards. You also want to identify individuals' responsibilities, and you should have your building's plans with the location of all the utility shuttles for water, gas, electricity, or any other types of utilities that may be appropriate. Again, this disaster plan should be available both digitally and physically. Other important information you may want to consider including in your disaster plan is the contacts and account information for your utilities or other relevant home or business services, contacts and account information for your homeowner's insurance or business insurance, contacts for emergency services, contacts for disaster response companies and contractors, so this will be your plumbers, electricians, etc. You also want to have your inventory of valuable possessions. However, you may want to keep this separately for security reasons. You don't want just anyone knowing what you have that's valuable. And you should also include an inventory for your disaster supplies and go kits to make it easier when you do your review of those supplies. Once you have created your disaster plan, it's then important to train your family and co-workers on this disaster plan through exercises. This can be done through evacuation and shelter in place drills. If you're in a place of business, you should do this at least biannually. 
And then you can also do tabletop exercises where you talk through different scenarios and discuss what you would do should that type of emergency happen. This can also be very valuable as you may see gaps in your plan that you weren't aware of ahead of time. With these exercises, you want to focus on the locations for your disaster supplies and fire extinguishers, how to appropriately use a fire extinguisher and your other disaster supplies, and the escape routes and safe meeting points should you need to evacuate. If you want more hands-on experience, you can look into community emergency response training. Other skills and knowledge you may consider getting training in is basic CPR, first aid, how and when to shut off your utilities, the proper use of personal equipment, protective equipment, and basic mold identification. Emergency preparedness and planning is an ongoing process and is cyclical, and this should be reviewed regularly to keep your plan up to date. Even if no disasters occur, you want to make sure that you have the appropriate information, especially if you've got contact details for plumbers or other uh, disaster response personnel because they may have changed. After any disaster, it's important to review what happened, how it was dealt with, and how to avoid that same disaster happening in the future or responding to it. You also want to say where the plan went right and responded and where people responded well, as well as giving credit where credit is due. So were you to have a pipe burst, you can then look into whether or not you need to have the rest of your plumbing addressed or at least assessed to prevent another pipe burst happening. Same as whether or not you've knocked that cup of coffee onto your laptop, you may change how you have liquids available in your spaces near important uh, electronics. We've mostly focused on smaller disaster. However, you may be uh, confronted with very large disasters. Again, if you live on the coast of Georgia, there's a strong possibility you may have to evacuate due to a hurricane. And in other areas in Georgia, we do get tornadoes that can cause um, massive damage. You want to make sure you follow your local, regional and national guidance for evacuation if one is called and the same for if there's any shelter in place orders. You also want to follow your dis family's disaster plan, but be prepared to be fle flexible because disasters can be quite chaotic and you may not have the plan follow as well as you would hope. If you do need to evacuate, you want to turn off your HVAC system to prevent any mold or soot being distributed throughout the house. You want to shut off your utilities, especially your gas, lock your windows and doors, and maybe even you need to board them up. And then you want to grab your go kits and your family members to evacuate where appropriate. Hopefully you won't be responding to a very large disaster at any point. However, it's important to at least think this through as Again, having that, that forethought and practice will allow you to better respond to it so that you can stop a small disaster becoming a very large disaster. You may also be the only person who is capable of responding to a disaster, or at least your home's disaster, if there is a larger regional disaster, as all the other resources and emergency um, services are taking care of other areas that are more in need. When responding to any disaster, time is critical. A, a swift response can be the difference between a small water leak and a flood with mold bloom. Disaster response should occur within 24 to 48 hours to minimize the damage, but certain types of disasters will need to be addressed by emergency services first and cleared before you're allowed access to your building to ensure that it's safe to be in there. You may simply also not have access to the region in total if there is a region-wide disaster. The preservation of human life and safety should always be uh, considered above uh, everything else. Responding to a disaster, you also want to identify possible secondary concerns. For example, if there were to be a fire, you may then have to think about any water damage, soot or heat damage due to that fire. This could affect the structure as well as causing things like mold to bloom if there's standing water. Due to severe winter weather, you also have to consider snow, ice and cold, which can make working in that space very difficult. Most types of disasters will have some form of water component. Fires are typically put out with water. If there's severe weather, you may have flooding. If there were to be any um, earthquakes or structural damage that occurs to your building, that can also then allow water to uh, come into your, your space. 
You want to consider you prepare for all the possible concerns before you re-enter the space so that you don't accidentally step into an additional hazard before you are aware of it. Other possible concerns on re-entry is gas and electricity not being properly shut off. This is especially important to consider if there's any standing water. You do not want to touch any water that may have an electrical current running through it. Chemicals and other hazards may be in water. One thing to consider is that flood water isn't just water. It's whatever's now been brought into that water as it's moved through the, uh, your space and the rest of the, the environment. And that includes whatever chemicals are under your kitchen sink or other people's kitchen sinks. There may also be asbestos, soot and other airborne particulates that can cause damage to your lungs. Smells and fumes may cause irritation. If there's been standing water or high humidity for a long period of time, there may be mold and this could be hazardous to your health. There may be structural dangers of damage to the building. So that may be something where you need somebody to come and assess the building before you re-enter. And then there may be pests and wildlife in your home because they are also escaping from that disaster and may use your home as refuge. When doing any re-entry, you want to make sure that you are wearing the proper personal protective equipment to protect your own health and safety. And what is proper PPE will be different, different depending on different types of disasters. You may want to consider having long sleeves and pants because you do not want your skin coming in contact with any biohazards such as mold. You want to have closed toed shoes and boots. If there's any risk of air, airborne particulates, you want to wear an N95 mask, especially if there's the risk of mold being in that space. Nitrile gloves are valuable to be wearing if you may need to touch stuff that is either contaminated or has got any hazardous materials on them. If there's any structural damage to the space, you may want to wear eye protection or a hard hat. There may be lack of power to your building, which means that you have no lighting. So then having a flashlight will be valuable for being able to traverse the building safely without potentially hurting yourself. And you should consider having a first aid kit to deal with any minor injuries that occur while you're responding to a disaster. A safety whistle is also valuable to have in case you were to be hurt and you're away from other people in that space. A notebook and pencil and camera or phone with a camera is very valuable to have for documentation, especially for any insurance claims that you may have. Safety should be of your highest concern when you are responding to any disaster and you should first look after yourself and then others around you. For any unknown water sources, always assume the worst. You don't know what's in there, so don't touch it with your bare hands. Same uh, idea with this, you don't want to put your hands in your, bath, in your mouth or on objects that could go into your mouth, such as any water bottles or food. You want to wash and hand sanitize your hands often. You should also drink lots of potable water to prevent any dehydration and take frequent rest breaks and eat regularly, especially if you are doing a longer response period. If it is a very large disaster, you may want to work in short shifts to prevent any burnout and fatigue. And if the disaster is more regional, such as if a tornado were to go through or there were to be some flooding, you want to subscribe to the weather and disaster updates for your affected area. If there's any um, emergency services on site, you want to follow the guidance of the acting authorities. And it's important to keep your expectations in check. A disaster can, is going to be very difficult to deal with, so you want to make sure that you don't think it's going to be better than it is and potentially cause trauma for yourself that way. So keep expectations in check for yourself, others, the general situation, and then the state of your home and possessions. You should institute a buddy system. So if one person is injured, there's somebody else who can get help or assist them. And you want to consistently evaluate yourself and others for physical and emotional challenges, including signs of fatigue or weakness, confusion, shortness of breath, dizziness, headaches, nausea or vomiting, irritability, muscle spasms, pain and excessive sweating. Don't be afraid to talk to other responders or mental health professionals because this can be a very traumatic thing to go through, especially if it's your home and it's some things that are very sentimental to you. It can be very traumatizing to be in that space. So if you aren't in the right frame of mind, you'll do more harm to yourself than good for your home and possessions by being that person who is responding. So you may need to let somebody else 
do the action response because it's just too traumatic for you. So once you've been given permission by any emergency services, if necessary, you want to go onto the site and into the building and document and photograph the current situation. You want to know what is currently going on, where any hazards are, what the current situation is in terms of the extent of damage. You can use insurance documents to help prevent becoming overwhelmed by this process, and it can help give guidance on how to appropriately assess the damage. Using this information, you can determine your goals and priorities. Then is the uh, response part to actually do the response. If you're able to, assemble your disaster team based on the size of the disaster and the response that's required. You may be the only person responding, or you may even need to call in outside vendors such as plumbers, electricians, disaster companies, or conservators. You want to know what your contractors are capable of before you just let them loose in your building, so make sure you ask good questions. You then want to relate to each team member their role and to whom they are reporting, and then the desired outcome of their task. For larger disasters, you may have multiple teams to limit exhaustion and or exposure to hazardous materials. You also want to check in with your disaster team to make sure that they are still feeling emotional, emotionally well enough to continue. If necessary, contact your insurance company. There should be a designated liaison between your disaster team and any external entities to ease the communication. You want to make sure that they're not getting conflicting information from different people. And again, you want to make sure you know what your insurance covers. And then you want to establish a central command post away from the disaster site. You want to cordon off the affected area and only allow access to the disaster response personnel. It's important that you maintain security procedures, especially if you've got a compromised site such as broken windows or locks that are no longer working. You then want to isolate any affected um, items to prevent cross-contamination. And if possible, remove materials from the location to avoid damage to them, especially for water events as mold can bloom in high humidity. And that way, anything that wasn't initially damaged by the disaster may become damaged by the mold. Next, you want to address the climate and environment as soon as possible. You should remove all standing water and use dehumidifiers or contact a disaster company to dry out your building. You want to reduce the humidity to avoid having that mold break out. The key to all water events is to keep the air moving. However, you do not want to raise the temperature to dry the location faster. That will actually encourage mold to grow faster. When you are assessing your materials, you would have done that um, priorities list. And after that, you then want to triage items so that you can make sure you're using your time and resources appropriately. You want to determine which items can be air dried or which can just simply be discarded. If there's any things like IKEA furniture or other non heirloom items, such as published books that may be easily replaced, it may be a better use of your time and resources just to throw that away and replace it later. You may need to contact a conservator or disaster response company if you have any valuable items that need to be specially seen to. You want to identify your priority items and areas and try to get to those as soon as possible. For very large disasters, you'll need to do a, this, a larger triage approach based on the available responders, resources and training that the responders have. You also want to have multiple voices involved in your triage efforts so you don't accidentally throw out grandma's prize candy dish. You want to know where your stuff is and where it's going, if it's going anywhere. So take notes on your priority decisions of what has been treated, discarded, etc. And that way you can maintain inventory control. It's often difficult to remember these decisions after the fact or where you moved something to. If you are doing a DIY triage, it's important to know your own limits and what you're capable of and when you need to have somebody else step in and do this for you. If you need to handle any wet items, you should only do them for items that are strong enough. For example, you can hang individual photographs, CDs or DVDs with plastic clothespins to dry them. You can fan books open to allow the pages to dry more quickly. And you can lay paper or metal objects on paper toweling that can absorb that excess moisture to dry them more quickly. 
You do want to change any absorbent material often to allow them to dry more quickly and also prevent them standing in their own water too long. You may need to contact a conservator or disaster company for anything that's beyond this or for anything that's very valuable. This is especially true for waterlogged materials, if mold remediation needs to be done or soot removed, if items need to be sterilized from dirty water, if there's been a pest infestation, or if you have photographs of prints that are now stuck together. If you're using a conservator to assist with any valuable materials, it's important that you get a trained, qualified professional. You want to make sure that you choose a conservator who specializes in the material of your item. For example, if you have a damaged painting, you'll contact a painting conservator, a damaged book, a book conservator, photograph, photograph conservator, etc. There are ways you can find conservators online through the Find a Conservator tools at the American Institute for Conservation, as well as the Southeast Regional Conservation Association. Both of these uh, institutions um, have their listed conservators vetted by them so that you know that they are appropriate for those types of materials. So you want to make sure that you vet your conservators before you hire them to make sure you aren't being swindled into giving up your prized possessions or paying a high dollar amount for low quality work. And be wary of volunteers like the unfortunate painter of the Monkey Christ. Disaster recovery can span from days to weeks to years, depending on the severity of the disaster and the scope of affected materials. If your home burns down, it's going to take a lot longer to to recover from that than it would be if you just had a pipe burst. Recovery could also include repair to your building structure, depending on how it was damaged, as well as conservation of any treasured items. One thing to be aware of is to set your expectations when you're dealing with damaged items that are to be conserved. Damaged items and materials often cannot be restored to the point that they were before the disaster. So don't think that that's going to be a magic wand that's going to fix everything. And the level of treatment will depend on the damage and your available resources. Full conservation can be incredibly expensive, so based on the funds available, you may only be able to have minor conservation treatments done. And you don't want to turn any of your items to the disaster site until the location has been repaired and is stable. Otherwise, you may accidentally cause things to be damaged a second time. This may include cleaning your furniture, or disinfecting it. When you are resuming building habitation, it's important that you replace your HVAC filters to remove any airborne particulates. You want to run taps and replace any water filters to uh, clear out any possible contaminants. And it's also important that you check any boil water orders for your region to see whether or not the water is potable. You want to remove all moldy materials, including drywall, and remove carpeting after all water events as the carpet will just hold on to that moisture and you don't know what's going to be going on there and that can be a hazard later. After any disaster, it's important to debrief the disaster team or your family members. You want to determine where the emergency plan and disaster response went right. Determine what could be improved in the future or what may need to be added to the disaster plan because there may be a gap. You also want to determine what next steps need to be taken for recovery, and this will include determining the amount of money and assigning funds towards repair and recovery. And lastly, you want to update your emergency plan and your training to reflect any lessons that you've learned. Recovery isn't just relegated to your environment and whether or not you're active in disaster response, you may be experiencing mental anguish caused by the disaster. This can manifest in forms of sadness and grief, PTSD, depression and anxiety, irritability and anger, or isolation and withdrawal. One way to counteract these effects is to connect to a larger community that can help with feelings of isolation. They can also be a great resource for information as well as uh, sharing of other types of resources. You can also seek out counseling that will allow you to deal with these feelings and give you some coping skills. Self-care is incredibly important when responding to a disaster. There are a lot of resources available online that can be very useful for you to use. Uh, the spreadsheet, the worksheet on the left-hand side is from mentalhealthfirstaid.org, and this is best prepared before disaster or other traumatic event occurs so you know what resources are available for you and how to deal with it. 
There are other uh, types of resources that you can find that can be specific to the type of disaster you're responding to and the psychological effects it may have on you. I've listed a few other disaster resources that you can use um, depending on the type of disaster you're dealing with. Uh, I would advise you to look through these resources ahead of time and they can be very useful for helping you create that disaster plan. The Federal Emergency Management Agency at www.ready.gov has a wide range of disaster uh, response information. The Georgia Emergency Management Agency has a lot of information related specifically to the state of Georgia and the specific types of disasters that may be affecting our region. You can also get information at the Department of Public Health, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, and the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. The Center for Disease Control has great information on what to do before and after specific types of disasters, especially the biological ones, such as the pandemic we are going through. And the Iowa Conservation and Preservation Consortium has a flood relief, flood recovery booklet that's very useful for responding to any flooding. This is not an exhaustive list, and I'd also encourage you just to Google the type of disaster you may be concerned about or dealing with, and you'll be able to find a lot of very valuable information online. One thing also to remember is that the Georgia Archives is another resource you can use. So if you have any type of disaster, you can reach out to us for advice on how to uh, deal with it. This information was more geared towards families and businesses. If you have any uh, requests for more in-depth information for organizations or resource uh, institutions, please reach out to us. We do have other programming that may be more appropriate to larger businesses or other types of agencies. So please use this as a resource. I'd like to give a special thanks to the Archives Assistant Conservator Tracy Johnson with her help preparing this presentation. And I'm happy to take any uh, questions you may have about disaster preparedness and response. Um, when can we access the assessment document you showed in one of your earlier slides? I am going to go back to that slide because I can't quite remember what it looked like. I would recommend you look at um, the Georgia Emergency Management Agency website, as well as FEMA. They've got a lot of great uh, resources that can walk you through. That they can walk you through uh, step by step how to deal with any type of disaster, as well as creating disaster uh, uh, disaster preparedness plans. Was it before this? I apologize, I'm a little lost in my own presentation. There it is. I do not remember where that came from. Uh, Christine Whitman. Ah, yeah, that seems to be a document from a, a previous uh, employee here. But I would say just uh, if you go on to also, the American Institute for Conservation has wonderful resources in how to prepare for a disaster and risk assessment documentation. So look them up as well. Okay. Can you give an example of a real life experience where being prepared has saved a home or organization? Well, I can give an example from us here at the Georgia Archives uh, where I want to say end of 2019, beginning of 2020, uh, one of the staff members went into one of our storerooms to just get some additional office supplies and noticed that there was some water on the carpet. So she notified the facilities team to come and just clean it up. And when they came back, the water had spread. And what we ended up doing was cutting the carpet and finding out that there was a sewage drain in the floor that we weren't even aware was there because it was covered by carpeting. And it had got backed up and now was overflowing. And by us having our emergency preparedness uh, done as appropriate, we could uh, get the disaster team going immediately. We pulled in our wet vacuum wet dry vacuum cleaners to be able to stop that water overflowing. We already had the contact details for our plumbers, so we had them come out immediately. We also had our staff come in quickly to be able to move all the materials out of that store area so it wouldn't be affected by this hazardous uh, 
water that was now flooding. And then we were also able to use some plastic sheeting we had on hand to be able to prevent any of that overflow water, which had unfortunately seeped through that second level floor into the first floor to stop that dripping onto um, microfilm readers. So within the scope of, I would say, 30 minutes to an hour, we had the situation completely under control. So that was just us knowing what to do in case a flood of some type were occur. We weren't expecting the flood to be due to a backed up drain that we weren't aware of, but at least the flood response was there for us. How often do you suggest an emergency plan was reviewed? An emergency plan should be reviewed at least annually. So that's routine review. It should also be reviewed if there's any major changes that happen in the intervening time. So if you have a small business and you have change in staff, you'll need to update their contact details. And you'll also need to make sure you train those new staff on your emergency procedures. So for us here at the archives, anytime we have a new person come in, they spend a couple of hours with us at the conservation lab and we go through basic safety and handling and what our emergency procedures are so they know what to do in case there were to be an evacuation or even just a fire drill. They know how to behave appropriately. Um, you talked about connecting to a larger community. Do you know if conservatives across the world are in contact with conservatives, say, in the UK? I do know that there has been a lot of um, communication and the conservation community has a couple of uh, distribution lists that we subscribe to that tend to be more global. And I've seen a lot of talk on those distribution lists about them being able to offer help or resources and just trying to check in and see what's happening. Um, it's difficult, obviously. Uh, I'm not too involved in that. That's kind of out of my wheelhouse, but I have seen some talk on those distribution lists that there is at least community involvement in that. I think it's probably more so in Europe than it is in the US, just based on geography. Um, I don't see any other questions, but is there anything else you want to add? I just like to say thank you very much for coming through to this presentation. Um, it's not the topic that anyone really wants to consider. We don't always want to think about the worst case scenario happening. However, you can make that worst be a little bit better just by having some forethought and planning and just thinking it through. And as we said, just by the process of thinking it through, you may be able to evolve, evolve, yeah. avoid 80, 90 percent of those disasters. Uh, one other thing I'd like to really encourage, whether it is um, just your family or a small business, is to reach out to your local fire department and police department. Uh, they really do want to be involved in the community, especially the fire department. Uh, if you have a small business, you can have them come out and do basic fire extinguisher training with you. Uh, they can also help give advice on fire protection fire prevention tips and let you know if there's any hazards around that you need to be aware of. So do try get involved with your local community uh, emergency response uh, personnel. I think that's it for me. So thank you very much for taking the time this afternoon to to listen to this presentation. Okay, Sigourney, thank you for that informative and very helpful presentation. And now for some information on our upcoming events. On Saturday, June the 4th, will be the annual genealogy picnic presented by the Georgia Genealogical Society and the Georgia Archives. What is exciting about this event is that there is an option to come in person or to view virtually. You have a choice. The genealogy picnic begins at 9 a.m. So you might want to get here a little bit early. For more information, register if you wish to attend virtually or submit a question for the panel. Go to our website www.georgiaarchives.org and look under announcements. Click under Summer Genealogy Picnic and you'll get your information there. Our June 10th Lunch and Learn presentation at noon is Carver County's Commuter Railroad, the Atlanta Northern Railway, 
by Todd DeFail, founder of the DeFail Group, author and railroad enthusiast. And once again, thank you for joining us.